Lesson 5 for January 23-29, to 29, Noble Prince of Peace, read by Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, January 3. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, once again we thank you for your word. We thank you that in this book of Isaiah we learn about the answer to this world's problems in the form of the life and death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the noble Prince of Peace. And as we open your word this week, we pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us and bless us. We also pray that in our personal lives, we will remember that you are our leader, our guide, and our God. Bless us each one, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our memory text this week is, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. That's Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. Let's read that again. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Dr. Robert Oppenheimer, who supervised the creation of the first atomic bomb, appeared before a U.S. Congressional Committee. They inquired of him if there were any defence against the weapon. Certainly, the great physicist replied, and that is... Dr. Oppenheimer looked over the audience and said softly, Peace. And that's from 7,000 Illustrations, or the Encyclopedia of 7,000 Illustrations of Signs of the Times by Paul Lee Tan, published in 1985, and that's from page 989. Peace is an elusive dream for the human race. It has been estimated that since the beginning of recorded history, the world has been entirely at peace only about 8% of the time. During these years, at least 8,000 treaties have been broken. During the half-century following the end of World War I, which was supposed to be the war to end all wars, there were two minutes of peace for every year of war. In 1895, Alfred Nobel, the inventor of dynamite, provided a trust to establish a prize for individuals who make an outstanding contribution to peace. However, even some winners of the Nobel Peace Prize have been involved in violent conflict. This week, we'll read about the only one who brings true, everlasting peace. Sunday, January 24. End of gloom for Galilee. Our text for today is Isaiah 9, verses 1 to 5. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. You have multiplied the nation and increased its joy. They rejoice before you according to the joy of harvest, as men rejoice when they divide the spoil. For you have broken the yoke of his burden and the staff of his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, as in the day of Midian, for every warrior's sandal from the noisy battle and garments rolled in blood will be used for burning and fuel for fire. Question. Why does Isaiah 9 1 begin with the word but or nevertheless that indicates a contrast to what precedes it? Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed. Isaiah 8, 21 and 22 that we read last week describes the hopeless condition of those who turn to the occult rather than to the true God. Wherever they look, they will 
see only distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness, as it said in verse 22. By contrast, there will come a time when there will be no gloom for those who were in anguish, Isaiah 9 verse 1. The people of the Galilee region are singled out here as receiving the special blessing of a great light, as we read in verse 2. The nation will be multiplied and rejoice because God will have broken the rod of their oppressor, as we read in verse 4. The region of Lake Galilee is depicted here because it was among the first territories of Israel to be conquered. In response to Ahaz's request for aid, tiglath pileser III took the Galilee and Transjordan regions of northern Israel, carried some of the people captive, and turned the territories into Assyrian provinces, as we read in Second Kings chapter 15 and verse 29. In the days of Pekah, king of Israel, tiglath pileser king of Assyria, came and took Ejon, Abel, Beth, Makar, Genoa, Kedesh, Hazor, Gilead and Galilee, all the land of Naphtali, and he carried them captive to Assyria. So, Isaiah's message is that the first to be conquered would be the first to see deliverance. Question. Whom does God use to deliver his people? Isaiah 9 Verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from the time forward even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And another question. When and how was the prophecy of Isaiah 9, 1 to 5 fulfilled? And we see this in Matthew chapter 4, verses 12 to 25. Now, when Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And, leaving Nazareth, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the regions of Zebulun and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light has dawned. From that time... Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he sought two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond the Jordan. Not by accident, Jesus' early ministry was in the Galilee region, where he gave hope by announcing the good news of God's kingdom and by healing people, including delivering demoniacs from bondage to the occult, as we read in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 24 just then. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed. 
Here is where we see a perfect example of how the Bible takes events that happened in Old Testament times and uses them to prefigure things that will happen in the New Testament times. The Lord mixed images from one era with those of another, such as in Matthew 24, when Jesus mingled the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70 with the destruction at the end of the world. So to finish today, if someone were to ask you, what has Jesus delivered you from, what would you answer? What personal testimony can you give regarding the power of Christ in your life? Monday, January 25, A Child for Us Our text for today is Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7, which we'll read shortly. Here is the third special birth in the book of Isaiah, following mentions of the births of Emmanuel and Meher Shalel Hashbaz. Question. What is special about the child found in these verses? Isaiah 9, Verses 6 and 7. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, to order it and establish it with judgment and justice. From that time forward... Even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Notice that this deliverer has several names or epithets that describe him in various ways. In the ancient Near East, kings and deities had multiple names to show their greatness. He is wonderful, just as the divine angel of the Lord described his own name to Samson's father as wonderful. In Judges thirteen eighteen to 20 we read, And the angel of the Lord said to him, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering, and offered it upon the rock to the Lord, and he did a wondrous thing, while Manoah and his wife looked on. It happened as the flame went up toward heaven from the altar. The angel of the Lord ascended in the flame of the altar. When Manoah and his wife saw this, they fell on their faces to the ground. It's the same Hebrew root as wonderful. And then ascended toward heaven in the sacrificial flame on Manoah's altar, as we just read in uh, verse 20, thereby prefiguring his offering of himself more than 1,000 years later. He is referred to as divine, or the mighty God, and the eternal creator, everlasting father, as we read in uh, Luke 3 and verse 38. The son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Adam, the son of God. He is a king of the dynasty of David. His kingdom of peace will be eternal. Question, given these attributes, whom alone could this child be? And we find the answer in Luke 2, verses 8 to 14. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, watching over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day, in the city of David, a Saviour, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe, wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Some have attempted to identify him with King Hezekiah, but the description far surpasses any ordinary human being. 
only one person fits, Jesus Christ, the divine Son of God and Creator. As we read in John 1, 1 to 3, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And verse 14, And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And Colossians 1, verses 5 to 17, Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you, as it has also in all the world, and is bringing forth fruit, as it also is among you since the day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth, as you also learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf, who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you, and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by Him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through Him, and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. And Colossians chapter 2 verse 9, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And Hebrews 1 verse 2, Has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Jesus was born to us in order to save us and to give us peace. He has received all authority in heaven and on earth, and he is with us always, as we read in Matthew 28, verses 18 to 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. While retaining his divinity, he also has become human for all time, ever able to sympathize with our weaknesses, as we read in Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Unto us a child is born forever. From the book Selected Messages, Book 1, pages 406 and 407, we read, When Christ came to our world, Satan was on the ground and disputed every inch of advance in his path from the manger to Calvary. Satan had accused God of requiring self-denial of the angels when he knew nothing of what it meant himself, and when he would not himself make any self-sacrifice for others. This was the accusation that Satan made against God in heaven. And, after the evil one was expelled from heaven, he continually charged the Lord with the exacting service which he would not render himself. Christ came to the world to meet these false accusations and to reveal the Father. End of quote. And so to finish the day, what does this quote tell us about the character of God?
Tuesday, January 26, The Rod of God's Anger Our text for today is Isaiah 9, verse 8, through to chapter 10, verse 34. This section explains Isaiah 9, 1 to 5, which predicts deliverance for the gloomy, anguished people who had trusted in the occult and fallen prey to military conquest and oppression. The rod of their oppressor, verse 4 had said, you have broken as on the day of Midian. Let's read Isaiah 9, verse 8 onwards. The Lord sent a word against Jacob, and it has fallen on Israel. All the people will know Ephraim and the inhabitant of Samaria, who say is pride and arrogance of heart. The bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. Therefore the Lord shall set up the adversaries of Rasin against him and spur his enemies on. The Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with an open mouth. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. For the people do not turn to him who strikes them, nor do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore the Lord will cut off head and tail from Israel, palm branch and bulrush in one day. The elder and honourable, he is the head. The prophet who teaches lies, he is the tail. For the leaders of this people cause them to err, and those who are led by them are destroyed. Therefore the Lord will have no joy in their young men, nor have mercy on their fatherless and widows, for every one is a hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaks folly. For all his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. For wickedness burns as the fire, it shall devour the briars and thorns, and kindled in the thickets of the forest, they shall mount up like rising smoke. Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts the land is burnt up, and the people shall be as fuel for the fire. No man shall spare his brother, and he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry. He shall devour on the left hand and not be satisfied. Every man shall eat the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh shall devour Ephraim, and Ephraim Manasseh. Together they shall be against Judah. For all this his anger is not turned away but his hand is stretched out. Chapter 10, verse 1. Woe to those who decree unrighteous decrees, who write misfortune which they have prescribed, to rob the needy of justice, and to take what is right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey, and that they may rob the fatherless. What will you do in the day of punishment, and in the desolation which will come from afar? To whom will you flee for help, and where will you leave your glory? Without me they shall bow down among the prisoners, and they shall fall among the slain. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Woe to Assyria, the rod of my anger, and the staff in his hand is my indignation. I will send him against an ungodly nation, and against the people of my wrath. I will give him charge, to seize the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Yet he does not mean so, nor does his heart think so, but it is in his heart to destroy, and cut off not a few nations, for he says, Are not my princes altogether kings? Is not Kalno like Karshemish? Is not Hamath like Arpad? Is not Samaria like Damascus? As my hand has found the kingdoms of the idols, whose carved images excel those of Jerusalem and Samaria, as I have done to Samaria and her idols, shall I not do also to Jerusalem and her idols? Therefore, it shall come to pass, when the Lord has performed all his work on Mount Sion and on Jerusalem, that he will say, I will punish the fruit of the arrogant heart of the king of Assyria, and the glory of his haughty looks. For he says, By the strength of my hand I have done it, and by my wisdom I am prudent. Also I have removed the boundaries of the people, and have robbed their treasuries. So I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. My hand was found like a nest the riches of the people, and as one gathers eggs that are left, I have gathered all the earth, and there was no one who moved his wing, nor opened his mouth, 
with even a peep. Shall the axe boast itself against him who chops with it? Or shall the saw wield itself against those who lift it up? Or, as if a staff should lift up, as if it were not wood? Therefore the Lord, the Lord of hosts, will send leanness among his fat ones, and under his glory he will kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. So the light of Israel will be for a fire, and his holy one for a flame. It will burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day, and it will consume the glory of his forest and of his fruitful field, both soul and body, and they will be as when a sick man wastes away. Then the rest of the trees of his forest will be so few in number that a child may write them. And it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel, and such as have escaped of the house of Jacob, will never again depend on him who defeated them, but will depend on the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. The remnant will return, the remnant of Jacob, to the mighty God. For though your people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, a remnant of them will return. The destruction decreed shall overflow with righteousness. For the Lord God of hosts will make a determined end in the midst of all the land. Therefore thus says the Lord God of hosts, O my people who dwell in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrian. He shall strike you with a rod and lift up his staff against you in the manner of Egypt. For yet a very little while then the indignation will cease, as will my anger in their destruction. And the Lord of hosts will stir up a scourge for him like the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. As his rod was on the sea, so will he lift it up in the manner of Egypt. It shall come to pass in that day that his burden will be taken away from your shoulder and his yoke from your neck, and the yoke will be destroyed because of the anointing oil. He has come to Aith. He has passed Migron. At Michmash he has attended to his equipment, and they have gone along the ridge, and they have taken up lodging at Geba. Ramah is afraid. Gibeah of Saul has fled. Lift up your voice, O daughter of Galam. Cause it to be heard as far as Laish. O poor Anathoth, Madmena has fled. The inhabitants of Gibbon seek refuge. As yet he will remain at Nob that day. He will refresh his fist at the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. Behold the Lord, the Lord of hosts, will lop off the bow with terror. Those of high stature will be hewn down, and the haughty will be humbled. He will cut down the thickets of the forest with iron, and Lebanon will fall by the mighty one. Question. Read through the sufferings of God's people as shown in the above text. Compare the curses in Leviticus 26, 14-39. Why did God punish his people in the stages rather than all at once? What does this indicate about his character and goals? Leviticus chapter 26, beginning at verse 14. But if you do not obey me and do not observe all these commandments, and if you despise my statutes, or if your soul abhors my judgments, so that you do not perform all my commandments but break my covenant, I also will do this to you. I will even appoint terror over you, wasting disease and fever, which shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. And you shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. I will set my face against you, and you shall be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you shall reign over you, and you shall flee when no one pursues you. And after all this, if you do not obey me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. I will break the pride of your power, I will make your heavens like iron and your earth like bronze, and your strength shall be spent in vain, for your land shall not yield its produce, nor shall the trees of the land yield their fruit. Then, if you walk contrary to me and are not willing to obey me, I will bring on you seven times more plagues according to your sins. I will also send wild beasts among you, which shall rob you of your children, destroy your livestock, and make you few in number, and your highways shall be desolate. And if by these things you are not reformed by me, 
but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you, and I will punish you yet seven times for your sins, and I will bring a sword against you that will execute the vengeance of the covenant. When you are gathered together within your cities, I will send pestilence among you, and you shall be delivered into the hand of the enemy. When I have cut off your supply of bread, ten women shall bake your bread in one oven, and they shall bring back your bread by weight, and you shall eat and not be satisfied. And after all this, if you do not obey me, but walk contrary to me, then I also will walk contrary to you in fury, and I, even I, will chastise you seven times for your sins. You shall eat the flesh of your sons, and you shall eat the flesh of your daughters. I will destroy your high places, cut down your incense altars, and cast your carcasses on the lifeless forms of your idols. And my soul shall abhor you. I will lay your cities waste, and bring your sanctuaries to desolation, and I will not smell the fragrance of your sweet aromas. I will bring you the land of desolation, and your enemies who dwell in it shall be astonished at it. I will scatter you among the nations and draw out a sword after you. Your land shall be desolate and your cities waste. Then the land shall enjoy its Sabbaths as long as it lies desolate and you are in your enemy's land. Then the land shall rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. As long as it lies desolate, it shall rest. For the time it did not rest on your Sabbaths when you dwelt in it. And as for those of you who are left, I will send faintness into their hearts in the lands of their enemies. The sound of a shaken leaf shall cause them to flee. They shall flee as though fleeing from a sword, and they shall fall when no one pursues. They shall stumble over one another, as if were before a sword, when no one pursues. And you shall have no power to stand before your enemies. You shall perish among the nations, and the land of your enemies shall eat you up. And those of you who are left shall waste away in their iniquity in your enemies' lands. Also in their father's iniquities, which are with them, they shall waste away. If God had wanted to destroy his people, he could have given them up to the Assyrians right away. But he is patient, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance, as it says in Second Peter 3 verse 9. As in the period of the judges, God let the people of Judah and Israel experience some results of their folly so they could understand what they were doing and have a chance to make a better choice. When they persisted in evil and hardened their hearts against him and the appeals he sent through his messengers, he further withdrew his protection. But they continued to rebel. This cycle was repeated in a downward spiral until there was nothing more God could do. Question. Read through Isaiah 9 verse 8 to chapter 10 verse 2. What sins are the people guilty of? Against whom have they committed them? Who is guilty among them? The Lord sent a word against Jacob, and it has fallen on Israel. All the people will know Ephraim and the inhabitant of Samaria, who say is pride and arrogance of heart. The bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we will replace them with cedars. Therefore the Lord shall set up the adversaries of Rason against him and spur his enemies on. The Syrians before and the Philistines behind, and they shall devour Israel with an open mouth. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. For the people do not turn to him who strikes them, nor do they seek the Lord of hosts. Therefore the Lord will cut off head and tail from Israel, palm branch and bulrush in one day. The elder and honourable, he is the head. The prophet who teaches lies, he is the tail. For the leaders of this people cause them to err, and those who are led by them are destroyed. Therefore the Lord will have no joy in their young men, nor have mercy on their fatherless and widows, for every one is a hypocrite and an evildoer, and every mouth speaks folly. For all his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. 
for wickedness burns as the fire. It shall devour the briars and thorns, and kindle in the thickets of the forest. They shall mount up like rising smoke. Through the wrath of the Lord of hosts the land is burnt up, and the people shall be as fuel for the fire. No man shall spare his brother, and he shall snatch on the right hand and be hungry. He shall devour on the left hand and not be satisfied. Every man shall eat the flesh of his own arm. Manasseh shall devour Ephraim, and Ephraim Manasseh. Together they shall be against Judah. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out. Chapter 10, verse 1. Woe to those who decree unrighteous decrees, who write misfortune which they have prescribed, to rob the needy of justice, and to take what is right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey, and that they may rob the fatherless. What we see here, as seen all through the Bible, is the reality of free will. God made humans free. He had to. Otherwise, we could never truly love him, and freedom involves the option to do wrong. And though time and again God seeks to woo us by revealing his love and character, he also will allow us to face the fruit of our wrong decisions, pain, suffering, fear, turmoil, and so forth, all in order to help us realise just what turning away from him leads to. And yet, even then, how often these things don't make people put away sin and come to the Lord. Free will is wonderful. We couldn't be human without it. Woe to those, however, who use it wrongly. And so to finish the day. How has God used suffering in your own life to turn you away from a wrong course? Wednesday, January 27, Root and Branch in One. Our text for today is Isaiah chapter 11, but we'll come to that later. First question, who is the shoot that comes out from the stump of Jesse in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 1? There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. Also, we're going to look at Zechariah chapter 3 and verse 8, and that reads, Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign. For behold, I am bringing forth my servant, the branch. And Zechariah 6.12, Then speak to him, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch, from his place he shall branch out, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Isaiah 11.1 1 picks up on the imagery of a felled tree in chapter 10, verses 33 and 34. Behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, will lop off the bough with terror. Those of high stature will be hewn down, and the haughty will be humbled. He will cut down the thickets of the forest with iron, and Lebanon will fall by the mighty one. The stump of Jesse represents the idea that the dynasty of David, son of Jesse, would lose its power as you read in Daniel 4, verses 10 to 17. These were the visions of my head while on my bed. I was looking, and behold, a tree in the midst of the earth, and its height was great. The tree grew and became strong. Its height reached to the heavens, and it could be seen to the ends of all the earth. Its leaves were lovely, its fruit abundant, and in it was food for all. The beasts of the field found shade under it, the birds of the heaven dwelt in its branches, and all flesh was fed from it. I saw in the visions of my head while on my bed, and there was a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven. 
he cried aloud and said thus, Chop down the tree and cut off its branches, strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit, let the beasts get out from under it and the birds from their branches. Nevertheless, leave the stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field. Let it be wet with the dew of the heaven and let him graze with the beasts on the grass of the earth. Let his heart be changed from that of a man, let him be given the heart of a beast, and let seven times pass over him. This decision is by the decree of the watchers, and the sentence by the word of the holy ones, in order that the living may know that the Most High rules in the kingdom of men, gives it to whomever he will, and sets over it the lowest of men." And Daniel 4, verses 20 to 26, The tree that you saw, which grew and became strong, whose height reached to the heavens, and which could be seen by all the earth, whose leaves were lovely and its fruit abundant, in which was food for all, under which the beasts of the field dwelt, and in whose branches the birds of the heaven had their home, it is you, O king, who have grown and become strong, for your greatness has grown and reached to the heavens, and your dominion to the end of the earth. And inasmuch as the king saw a watcher, a holy one, coming down from heaven and saying, Chop down the tree and destroy it, but leave its stump and roots in the earth, bound with a band of iron and bronze in the tender grass of the field, let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let him graze with the beasts of the field, till seven times pass over him. This is the interpretation, O king, and this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my lord the king. They shall drive you from men, your dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make you eat grass like oxen. They shall wet you with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over you, till you know that the most high rules in the kingdom of men, and gives it to whomever he chooses. And, inasmuch as they gave the command to leave the stump and roots of the tree, your kingdom shall be assured to you, after you come to know that heaven rules. But there would arise a shoot or branch from the apparently doomed stump, that is, a ruler descended from David. Question, why is the new Davidic ruler also called the root of Jesse in Isaiah 11.10? And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. What sense does this make? Revelation 22.16 I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify to you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright and morning star. The description fits only Jesus Christ, who is both the root and the descendant of David, as we read just now in Revelation 22.16. Christ came from the line of David, who was descended from Adam, who was the Son of God, as we read in Luke 3, verses 23 to 31. Now Jesus himself began his ministry at about 30 years of age, being, as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Jenna, the son of Joseph, the son of Mattathiah, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Esli, the son of Nagai, the son of Marth, the son of Mattathiah, the son of Semei, the son of Joseph, the son of Judah, the son of Joannes, the son of Reshai, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adai, the son of Kosam, the son of Elmodam, the son of Ur, the son of Jos, the son of Eleazar, the son of Joram, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonan, the son of Elohim, the son of Malia, the son of Menan, the son of Mathatha, the son of Nathan, the son of David. Christ came from the line of David, as we've just read, who was descended from Adam, who was the Son of God, as it said in verse 38, in the sense that Christ 
created him. As we read in John 1, verses 1 to 3, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And verse 14, And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Christ was David's ancestor, as well as his descendant. Question, in what ways does the new Davidic ruler reverse the evil effects of sin and apostasy? Let's read this in Isaiah chapter 11. Verse 1 begins, There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. His delight is in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge by the sight of his eyes, nor decide by the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor, and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall slay the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt of his loins, and faithfulness the belt of his waist." The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them, the cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox, the nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den." They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. And in that day there shall be a root of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people, for the Gentiles shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people who were left from Assyria and Egypt, from Pathros and Cush, from Elam and China, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Also the envy of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not harass Ephraim. But they shall fly down upon the shoulder of the Philistines toward the west. Together they shall plunder the people of the east. They shall lay their hand on Edom and Moab, and the people of Ammon shall obey them. The Lord will utterly destroy the tongue of of the sea of Egypt. With his mighty wind he will shake his fist over the river, and strike it in the seven streams, and make men cross over dry shod. There will be a highway for the remnant of his people, who will be left with Assyria, as it was for Israel, in the day that he came up from the land of Egypt. He thinks and acts in harmony with the Lord, judges fairly, punishes the wicked, and brings peace. When he takes over, the Lord will bring back, restore and unite a faithful remnant of Israel and Judah, as we read before in Isaiah 10, 20-24. There will be a strong united monarchy, as in the days of King David, who defeated the Philistines and other places. But the new ruler will be greater than David in that he will restore peace even to the essence of creation itself. Predators will no longer be carnivorous, and they will coexist in tranquillity with their former prey, as we read in verses 6 to 9. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, the leopard shall lie down with the young goat, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, the young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. Question. 
is Isaiah 11, talking about just the first coming of Christ, just the second, or both? Look through the prophecy and mark down which texts talk about which coming. In Isaiah 11, both comings of Jesus are presented as one picture. They are tied together because they are two parts of a whole, like the two sides of a flat plane. The plan of salvation, to be completed, requires both comings. The first, which already has happened, and the second, which we await as the consummation of all our hopes as Christians. And so to finish the day, what did Christ accomplish at the first coming that gives us such assurance about the second coming? What is the purpose of the first coming if it doesn't result in the second? Thursday, January 28, you comforted me. Our text for today is Isaiah chapter 12, verses 1 to 6, but more of that later. Isaiah 12 is a short psalm or song of praise to God for his merciful and powerful comfort. The psalm, put in the mouth of a member of the restored remnant, compares the promised deliverance to that of the Hebrews in the Exodus from Egypt, as we also read in Isaiah chapter 11 and verse 16. There will be a highway for the remnant of his people who will be left from Assyria as it was for Israel in the day that he came up from the land of Egypt. It is like the song of Moses and the Israelites when they were saved from Pharaoh's army at the Red Sea. And we read the song of Moses in Exodus chapter 15. Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea. His chosen captives also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank to the bottom like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, has become gracious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. And in the greatness of your excellence, you have overthrown those who rose against you. You sent forth your wrath. It consumed them like stubble. And with the blast of your nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The floods stood upright like a heap. The depths congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall be satisfied on them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You blew with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. You, in your mercy, have led forth the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy habitation. The people will hear and be afraid. Sorrow will take hold of the inhabitants of Philistia. Then the chiefs of Edom will be dismayed. The mighty men of Moab, trembling, will take hold of them. All the inhabitants of Canaan will melt away. Fear and dread will fall on them. By the greatness of your arm, they will be as still as stone. Till your people pass over, O Lord, till the people pass over, whom you have purchased. You will bring them in and plant them in the mountain of your inheritance, in the place, O Lord, which you have made for your own dwelling, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord shall reign for ever and ever. For the horses of Pharaoh went with his chariots and his horsemen into the sea, and the Lord brought back the waters of the sea upon them. But the children of Israel went on dry land in the midst of the sea. 
Question. Compare this song in Isaiah 12 to Revelation 15 verses 2 to 4, the song of Moses and the Lamb. What are they both praising God for? Isaiah 12, beginning at verse 1. And in that day you will say, O Lord, I will praise you, though you are angry with me, your anger is turned away, and you comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation, I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, the Lord, is my strength and song, he also has become my salvation. Therefore with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And in that day you will say, Praise the Lord, call upon his name, declare his deeds among the peoples. Make mention that his name is exalted, sing to the Lord, for he has done excellent things. This is known in all the earth. Cry out and shout, O inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst. And then we come to Revelation chapter 15, verses 2 to 4. And I saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire, and those who have the victory over the beast, over his image and over his mark and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God. They sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvellous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints. Who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you, for your judgments have been manifested. Isaiah 12 too comes close to identifying the coming deliverer as Jesus. It says that God is my salvation and he has become my salvation. The name Jesus means the Lord is salvation, as we read in Matthew one twenty one, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Question, what is the significance of the idea contained in the name of Jesus that the Lord is salvation? Not only does the Lord bestow salvation, as we read in Isaiah 12 too, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, the Lord, is my strength and song. He also has become my salvation. But he himself also is salvation. The presence of the Holy One of Israel in our midst, in verse 6, Cry out and shout, O inhabitant of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel in your midst, is everything to us. God is with us. Not only did Jesus do miracles, but he also became flesh and lived among us, as we read in John 1.14. Not only did he bear our sins on the cross, but he also became sin for us, as we read in 2 Corinthians 5.21. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Not only does he make peace, but he also is our peace in Ephesians 2.14. For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. No wonder the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples, as it says in Isaiah 11.10. When he is lifted up on the cross, he draws all people to himself, as we read in John twelve thirty two to 33 And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all peoples to myself. This he said, signifying by what death he would die. A remnant shall return to the mighty God, we read in Isaiah ten twenty one, who is the child born for us, the Prince of Peace that we've already read earlier in Isaiah 9, verse 6. So, to finish today, dwell more on this idea that Jesus is our salvation. Read Romans three twenty four, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. It says that redemption is in Jesus. Redemption is something that happened in him, and it is through God's grace and mercy that we can have an eternal share in that redemption as well. 
In other words, that redemption that was in him can become ours by faith and not by works, because no works we do are good enough to redeem us. Only the works that Christ did, which he credits to us by faith, can bring redemption. How does this truth give you hope and assurance of salvation, especially when you feel overwhelmed by your own sense of unworthiness? Friday, January 29. From the book The Desire of Ages, page 49, by Ellen G. White, we read, The heart of the human father yearns over his son. He looks into the face of his little child and trembles at the thought of life's peril. He longs to shield his dear one from Satan's power, to hold him back from temptation and conflict. To meet a bitterer conflict and a more fearful risk, God gave his only begotten Son that the path of life might be made sure for our little ones. Here in his love, wonder, O heavens, and be astonished, O earth. End of quote. And from the same author, writing in the Signs of the Times on March 5, 1896, Christ was the one who consented to meet the conditions necessary for man's salvation. No angel, no man, was sufficient for the great work to be wrought. The Son of Man alone must be lifted up, for only an infinite nature could undertake the redemptive process. Christ consented to connect himself with the disloyal and sinful to partake of the nature of man, to give his own blood, and to make his soul an offering for sin. In the councils of heaven, the guilt of man was measured, the wrath for sin was estimated, and yet Christ announced his decision that he would take upon himself the responsibility of meeting the conditions whereby hope should be extended to a fallen race. End of quote. And that brings us to our one discussion question this week. As we saw in Isaiah chapter 11, the Lord presented both comings of Christ in one picture. This can help explain at least somewhat why some of the Jews didn't accept Christ at his first coming because they expected him to do the things that will happen only at the second coming. What does this tell us about how important it is that we have a proper understanding of the nature of Christ's advent? How can false views, for instance, of his second coming set people up for Satan's great end-time deception? And we're recommended here to read from the Great Controversy, chapter 39, The Time of Trouble, 22 very interesting pages. I'll leave you to do that at your leisure. And to summarise this week's lesson, in the days of Isaiah, whose name means salvation of the Lord, God promised his remnant people salvation from the oppression that was coming upon them as a result of national apostasy. This prophecy of hope finds its ultimate fulfilment in Jesus, whose name means the Lord is salvation. Inside Story Our mission story this week is titled Three Lost Boys and once again it's by Andrew McChesney of Adventist Mission. Marta Aguera, a nurse, and her physician husband Louis Arboin were enjoying Mexican Independence Day celebrations on the central town square when a former patient interrupted their conversations. Marta, I want to talk to you, said the elderly woman, Grandmother Anna. She explained that her son-in-law had died seven days earlier at the age of 33 after a heart attack. Her daughter had been in prison for the past eight years. That left her with three grandsons aged 10, 9 and 7. 
She wasn't working and she couldn't take care of them. Moreover, the boys were sad and crying. I don't know what to do, she said. Marta also wasn't sure and she spoke with the church pastor. He advised inviting the brothers to a special horse-themed children's week of prayer. The program called Jesus, Take the Rope of My Life would start in two weeks. Grandmother Anna readily agreed to send her grandsons to the evening meetings. The eldest grandson, ten-year-old Juan, initially didn't want to go because he had never been inside a church. The middle grandson, nine-year-old Louis, had not heard about God before and he wanted to learn more. He cried when he heard about Jesus dying for his sins. He remembered his own father's death. The youngest boy, seven-year-old Francisco, slept a lot at first. Soon the boys couldn't wait to go to the meetings. Grandmother Anna saw the boys wearing new clothes from the church members and she thought that they wanted to go to receive more gifts. To her surprise, she found out that they didn't care about the clothes. They wanted to learn about Jesus. The boys fell in love with Jesus during the week of prayer and attended church every Sabbath after it ended. Marta began to give children's Bible studies to the boys every Sabbath afternoon. Six months later, the pastor invited the boys to an adventurer campout. The boys loved the morning and evening worships. At one worship, a nine-year-old disabled boy gave a personal testimony and announced that he wanted to be baptised. Lewis was touched by the story and decided that he also wanted to give his heart to Jesus. When he told his brothers, they also declared that they wanted to be baptised. The church was packed for the special day. Today, the boys 15, 13 and 12, whose picture appears here right beside this story, and run the church's audiovisual system on the Sabbaths. Lewis has preached six sermons and hopes to become a pastor. The boys are totally different children than who they were when I asked for help on Independence Day five years ago, Grandmother Anna said. I thank Marta and her husband, Lewis. Lewis, however, said all credit goes to the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit who does the work, he said. This lesson was read by Dr. Percy Harold for Christian Services for the Blind. It's supported by the Sabbath School Department and Hope Channel Australia and is rebroadcast by Christian Record Services and through podcasts at It Is Written in the United States, Hope Channel Germany and through Apple iTunes and SoundCloud. Remember, God is always faithful.